Hello, I'm Michael Whitmore. I'm the director of the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC, the world's largest collection of original materials connected to William Shakespeare. And I am so delighted to be able to have the opportunity to talk about the Folger Collection and our educational work at the Shakespeare Festival of Buenos Aires. Hello, Michael. How are you? Well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for your time. Um, let's start uh, talking about the, uh, the Folger Library. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, its origins? And uh, when, when we say Folger Library, what are we talking about? So the Folger Shakespeare Library is a special collections research library that has thousands and thousands of volumes that were printed between 1470 and 1730. So the collection covers not just Shakespeare, but really the history of Northern Europe, its rare books, its manuscripts. And then there's a magnificent uh, reading room where scholars come and we actually fund them to come and do research on these, on these texts. But it's also in a building that is two blocks east of the US Capitol. And it's next to the Supreme Court and the Library of Congress. So the founders of the Folger, Henry and Emily Folger, uh, they established the institution in 1932. That's when it opened. And it was a gift to the American people. And I like to think of their gesture of putting this magnificent Shakespeare resource next to the Congress and the Supreme Court. I think that what they were thinking was that there's a place for poetry, theater, and history in the life and the work of a democracy. And, and if you look where the Folger is, the, the institutions that are right around it are the institutions where the, the, the word, the written word, the spoken word is so important, whether that's legislators creating laws or justices who are interpreting them. Uh, the Library of Congress is one of the greatest collections of books in the world. But if you just think of that all together, I think it adds up to a statement, which is that we do need to know about history. We need to be inspired by stories. We need to have beautiful language so that we can be part of the community that is a democracy. And Michael, uh, which is uh, the most valuable book that the, uh, that the library has? Well, valuable has different meanings for different people. So one of the most valuable books for Shakespeare scholars and enthusiasts is a book called The First Folio. The First Folio was printed in 1623 and is a collection of 36 of Shakespeare's plays that were brought together by two of Shakespeare's friends after he died. And they put it in this large format book, which we call a folio. And it's, 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 it's about like this. And though that type of book was reserved really for laws, for history, for theology, very elevated topics, but they decided to put plays and only plays in this book. So not only is it the first collected version um, that was printed and survives, um, that became popular of Shakespeare's plays. It's also the source for 18 of his plays, including Julius Caesar, Much Ado About Nothing, many of the late plays. So it's a really important book for that reason, but it's also one of the closest links we have to William Shakespeare and the world he lived in. So the Folgers actually collected that book and they collected 82 copies of that book. Now there are about uh, there are just over 200 copies of the book that survive. I, I, I believe it's 235. So they really did collect up to a third of the surviving copies of this book. And that's really incredible. It's, it's the most studied single volume book, uh, at least one of them, but perhaps the most of anything printed. So it's, it's really an interesting book.
But there are other books that, um, or manuscripts that people might not think about. So we have what we call a unique copy of the play Titus Andronicus. And that means it's in a smaller format like this, but it's the only copy of that book that is in existence. And it was discovered in a lottery wrapper. Uh, it had a Dutch lottery wrapper around it. It was just the pages with the wrapper. And then someone looked at it and realized that this was the only copy of a Shakespeare play. So that's very rare and valuable. And we have that book. We also have, uh, to me, what I really love, we have a copy of Walt Whitman's copy. We have Walt Whitman's copy of the sonnets and Shakespeare's poems. It's a little format book and Whitman used to carry it in his pocket and, and he signed it. And I love that because as you know, and as your teachers know, really the history of Shakespeare is the history of people reinterpreting him, using him, translating him. And I just think it's so interesting that this major American poet chose to have the words of Shakespeare in his pocket all the time. And so I, I really love that book too. Well, to me, I, I have to tell you, last time I visited the library, I had the chance to take a look at uh, Queen Elizabeth the First Bible, and uh, well, it, it was amazing. So we have a beautiful red velvet covered Bible called uh, it's the Bishop's Bible, and we believe that it was a gift to Queen Elizabeth. It has beautiful tooling silver. Uh, it 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 is a magnificent book that looks fit for a queen, and so. Uh, we, we, we like to think not just of Shakespeare's books, but about, about the books around him, right, that influence people. And Shakespeare was uh, a, a feature of the English royal court. He, he, he presented plays to monarchs. So our collection also covers uh, the, the royals and the, the, the Tudor and Stuart history around Shakespeare. So we have a, a gift roll, which is a, a piece of rolled parchment from Queen Elizabeth, where they were keeping track of all the gifts that she got. And then she wrote down all of the gifts that she was giving. And there's this magnificent signature of Elizabeth I on the top of that document. So we have signatures of English monarchs from Henry VII through Queen Anne. And, and those are really interesting documents that those uh, those those important people signed and held in their hands. Michael, the library as well uh, has uh, educational programs and what it's called like the uh, Folger method. Uh, can you can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, well, and I'd love to talk about that. So uh, I know that Shakespeare is beloved in Argentina, and I I think about your great librarian Borges, who wrote so beautifully, both about libraries and about Shakespeare. By the way, Borges actually read and lectured at the Folger. Uh, there's a recording of it, but he, uh, he was lecturing on metaphor, I believe. So uh, we are also helping teachers and students read and interpret these plays. And our Folger method in our education group is about giving students access to the real thing. So we, we believe that you don't have to, uh, tr to put Shakespeare in modern, easier language or to paraphrase. We would just like to give the original words to students and they, they, they engage with these words by speaking them out loud. And that's so important because as you know, learning is not just the mind, it's the body. And there's something very powerful about having young people who, you know, instead of looking at their phones are looking at each other eye to eye and they're reading lines from these plays and then they're learning from their interaction what some of these words must mean. And, and that's really the full human being, right? That, that is learning in that way. So the Folger method has said that students deserve the real thing and that teachers are some of the most important people in the world and that we need to give them the tools that will allow them to make their classrooms so much more effective to really energize students. And another very important thing, students bring their own perspectives. And we live in a world where at least in, in my country, 
the United States, we're struggling to understand how everyone is included in the democracy that we live in. And, and it's very painful to recognize that in our history, uh, large numbers of Americans have been excluded. And, and sometimes Shakespeare was used to do that uh, in colonial settings. But we also know that students can bring themselves and their own experience to the words and make those words mean new or different things. And so really encouraging students to see the connections between, let's say the problem that Romeo has being in the wrong family and the writers that they're reading today who write about belonging or not belonging. You know, we, we tend to think of Shakespeare and, you know, it, it's so important that we learn about these great and important writers, but it's just as important that we learn the connections. So for example, in the case of, of uh, North America, think about Hamlet, which is a ghost story and it's about haunting and memory. Well, doesn't that have something to say uh, to Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved, which is also about being haunted and about the, about difficult, awful things that have happened in the past. But you can see that there's a dialogue there. And in the case of Toni Morrison, she actually uh, wrote a, an important piece called Desdemona, which was her interpretation of how Desdemona fit into the Othello story. So we tend to think of this as a dialogue. And in our current work with teachers, we're trying to enable teachers to make those links so that students can really see how the stories from these plays are resonating with our own experiences and with a much broader range of voices and people. And I'm thinking, uh, I mean, nowadays, we have this cancel culture, right? And uh, um, in Shakespeare plays, we have characters like uh, Shylock, the Shrew, Othello, um angelo in measure for measure so um how do you uh, work with the students these characters in this place yeah well you, you know the plays contain very challenging things and shakespeare was part of a racist culture i mean just for example he was also part of a culture that was uh was polarized around religion we know uh, we also know that class was so powerful in, in the late feudal world that Shakespeare was a part of, becoming a, a mercantile capitalist world. So there are things that characters do and say that feel both insulting and wrong or that, that repeat ideas that came to be taken up and used for really painful and awful purposes. So you know, our, our view is that we do have to acknowledge that. We also need to support the teacher and the students because there may be moments when they really wanna talk about that. You know, what is it, why is Othello particularly being targeted for jealousy by Iago because of his racial, uh, the way he stands apart from both his wife and from Venetian culture. And so that's one question. Another question was, did people think about race in the same way in the 17th century? And there are some, there are some similarities and um, it's important to know that. It's also important to know the history of where those ideas came from. So, you know, I would say, Patricio, we really want to help teachers to lead those discussions especially if students are feeling that this is a place where they can work something, you know, work out how we got here. Um, but it's tricky, I will say, because not all teachers are ready to do that work. And students shouldn't be asked to reflect on things that they're not ready to talk about. Um, they should be challenged though. And so I, I think that's actually an area where teachers have come to us and asked us for advice. And that will be one of the, that's one of the most important areas now of the work that we do. Yeah, very, very interesting, Michael. And uh, during 
during the pandemic, how did you manage to keep on going with the classes? Do you, did you have uh, online resources for students and teachers? We, we discovered that people did want to engage online. So if you looked at Shakespeare's birthday last year, that was April 23rd. And in the United States, that was uh, about a little over a month after the entire country went into restrictions because of COVID. And so we started putting up free resources. Uh, we, we, our texts are always there and are always free. Uh, but we also started to do teaching sessions in a new online platform um, for teachers that allowed them to come into Zoom sessions, uh, sometimes of more than 100, to talk about challenges about teaching online. And these teachers are experiencing this incredible stress because now they have to, they have to communicate and interact through this tiny little camera while looking at a screen instead of a person. So we really started to do more of that teacher training online. And there's now a teacher membership for teaching Shakespeare so that teachers can sign up and get regular curriculum updates. We also share the stories that we have. So we have a very popular podcast called Shakespeare Unlimited. And it, it is something that a student or a teacher can listen to to learn more about a topic. And so that group is now putting much, much more online and trying to find ways to support teachers. We also put online a free uh, viewable version of a performance of Macbeth that was done on the Folger stage, which turned out to be very popular. Uh, and, and the other resource that we have is we've, the Folger Shakespeare, which is the text of the plays, we commissioned uh, audio performances of the most popular ones and made sure that the words that you hear are exactly the same as the ones that are on the page. So Patricio, we've been trying to figure out ways to use the digital access to give teachers much more ability to teach in the current shutdown conditions. Wow, do you keep doing this uh, regular meetings on Zoom? I mean, do you have to be, I believe you have to be member to attend them, right? So, so for the interactive synchronous meetings, uh, being a member of Teaching Shakespeare will allow you to sign up and, and interact in those live events. But we've also placed uh, some instructional videos online on our YouTube channel. And I encourage your visitors to go to the Folger Shakespeare Library's YouTube channel because there are resources there as well. Yeah. Um, Michael, nowadays uh, the building is closed, but um, would you like to tell us how do you work in normal days with uh, researchers? Sure. So we do have, if you come to visit the Folger, and I hope you do, you will visit a building that actually looks like it's from Renaissance England. There's a long banqueting hall. There's a permanent Renaissance theater. And then there's a reading room where mostly scholars, but also teachers now are coming in to use this collection of rare books and manuscripts. So we do serve uh, people who have questions and wanna learn more about these materials. And so um, that's part of what we do, but we also interpret all of that material and we've, we've done it on stage when we perform but we have also tried to do it in exhibitions in our great hall. The challenge for us, Patricio, was that this great hall, which had a series of very tall open windows, was designed to be full of bright daylight. And that's actually very dangerous for old books and manuscripts because the light will make the ink fade and eventually you won't see anything. So that was a big flaw. And we realized we needed a better place to show this collection. And the collection is massive. Uh, it, it's 22,000 linear feet. So if you lined them up, right, it would go from, it would go from our library past the Washington Monument. It's, it's, it's very, very large. And we've never really been able to give the public a sense of all that's in there. And so we started a very major renovation project that is going to add two very large galleries in our new entry, 
which and some beautiful gardens where you can sit and and think. Well, we're going to add a, a eating and drinking space upstairs in our marvelous great hall. But these galleries are going to be places where we can show the the hundreds, the thousands of works that are in our collection and help, you know, a teacher uh, from, from Argentina who would be coming or a teacher from South or Central America should be able to come to our galleries and see these beautiful, very rare things and then be able to say to students, um, hey, did you know that Shakespeare's hand, we don't have Shakespeare's handwriting, what we know of these plays comes from books. And the books sometimes disagree. You know, there, there are several versions of Hamlet and they're quite different. And part of how we get these words in the first place is because we become aware of how difficult it is to sometimes know what the right word is. But if you've actually seen one of the books and you, you, you see the difference, you see what's on the page, you then have the ability to speak to a student and say, you know, you feel very confident. And, and I think that's one of the advantages of being able to truly show this collection. We will show all 82 of the first folios, which in a way is a kind of a memorial or a remembrance of this great writer. But I hope also that the next Shakespeare, you know, maybe she comes from Washington DC, maybe she comes from, Argentina, maybe she comes from Japan, maybe she comes, he comes from South Africa. We want to find that next powerful transform, transformative writer and inspire that person to think, you know, it, what a crazy thought, right? I could tell a story that lasts for 400 years. And, and Patricia, you know, so I'm one of those people who believes that we still have great, powerful artists who are writing stories that will last hundreds of years. And our challenge is to find them. We, we have to find them. And we also, we really need to be open-minded about where these people will come from. You know, I, I think a lot of people say uh, 50 years ago would have thought, well, you know, the only, the next great Shakespeare is going to come from, London or New York City or I that can't be right right you, you look at the talent is so distributed over the world that we don't know and so you know my philosophy would be let's place our bets on everybody and and let's prepare for a future in which we can truly engage a wide audience who may not think Shakespeare is for them that's fine you know, um, it's, it, we shouldn't be required. <laughs> the reason to read these plays is because they're powerful stories that speak to where we are now, where we were and where we want to go. And there are many, many writers who have that power and ability. This, this is one of them who has been particularly influential. I agree, I agree, I agree. <laughs> Michael, uh, would you like to send a message to uh, Shakespeare fans and, and teachers and students here in Argentina? Um, oh, sure. Yeah, no, I, uh, yeah. Patricio, I, I, I so value the fact that you have brought, you know, you, you're a very thoughtful person, but you also believe that we can learn a lot from these stories and that we should keep reacting to them and teachers and students should do that. So I, I really respect that and I respect the work that you've done. And I hope that some of the students that you reach, some of the teachers, I hope that someday if they come to Washington DC, that they will come to the Folger Shakespeare Library and they will see things that, that actually they've always wanted to see or, or that will inspire them. Because I wanna say to your audience, uh, we're setting the table. For you you know we're we are preparing to be ready for you and i would i would so love to have visitors from argentina south america central america because i know how how lively and how vibrant the connection with great literature and great art and, and even shakespeare himself specifically is well thank you so much michael for your time for your your passion uh for supporting the uh 
the, all the activities uh, of the Festival Shakespeare Buenos Aires and uh, Fundación Romeo. It's always, uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, thank you for all the great work you're doing. Well, thanks, thanks to you. Yeah, thanks to you. Yeah. See you soon, Michael. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye, Patricio. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.